Vincent Chen's death became a symbol shared by Chinese Americans, an emblem of identity. But what was the identity, the history they share? At the time of his death, the Chinese in America numbered almost a million. Nearly half were new immigrants. And for these newcomers, the scars of exclusion, even the battles over civil rights, were something remote, learned from newspapers and books. Chinese Americans were dividing as their numbers climbed. The poor and working class clustered in the old Chinatowns, making the streets more crowded and vital than ever. The more educated, meanwhile, made straight for the Main Street. But for new arrivals of whatever class, America was not about what had been, but what could be. For the poor, looking back was a luxury they could ill afford. And the fortunate? Well, they were going to make history, not repeat it. Jerry Yang is co-founder of Yahoo, one of the most recognized brands on the internet. He left Taiwan in 1978. I do remember leaving Taiwan, and it feels uh, a bit like a dream. I was, I was just about to turn 10. I remember landing in LA. You have lines upon lines of people trying to get through immigration. Everybody had their belongings with them, you know, black people, white people, yellow people, They're all coming in the country. Basically, we had everything we ever owned, you know, my mom and my brother and me and a few suitcases and um, didn't really understand the language. You know, it was very much like a scene out of a movie. It's loud and it's noisy and it's big, everything is huge and there's land everywhere and there's cars everywhere. And so that was the imagery that I remember um, uh, of, of my first day in the United States. I never felt that I didn't belong. I felt like this is where I'm going to be. I think for me it's, it was much more of a, a journey. You know, it's a journey of um, understanding how in this new world I could fit in. Every generation of my family has immigrated. My parents immigrated from Taiwan, but my grandparents really immigrated from China. They fled during the war when the communists invaded. And so I think my parents grew up in a family where at any moment we had to pick up our things and leave. And they didn't want that for me and my brother. They thought America's safe. America's a land of good fortunes and dreams. So they wanted to come to America. Jean Tang's family arrived in America in 1978, the same year as Jerry Yang, completing a 7,000-mile journey from Taiwan to an aunt's house in Springfield, Illinois. My dad was a construction worker, and my mom was a waitress. Um, and she worked at two or three different restaurants. And my dad basically tried to find as many odd jobs as he could to fill up a day and, and make some money. They were lost. They were 35 years old, and um, they didn't know the language very well. And uh, they tried to, their best to hide their insecurity and their fear from us. And so small things like going to the grocery store, not knowing where to buy things, or not knowing how to use a checkbook and write out instead of 150, you have to write out 150 and spell it out. And so my brother and I would always be at the grocery store helping out my parents doing these type of things. In certain situations outside the home, you were the parent and they were the child. Like so many new immigrants, Jean's family turned to relatives for help. Her uncle owned a clothing store in a rundown section of LA. And after three tough years in Springfield, the Tangs moved west to run it. They kept its doors open every day of the year, Thanksgiving and Christmas too. After school, Jean would help customers, while her younger brother kept watch for shoplifting. 
the message that me and my brother got growing up was you guys need to study, you guys need to be professionals, you don't want to live like this, like me and your mom. The most tense uh, time was when we had to present our report cards. When we opened it and we got a B, there was a lot of guilt, there was a lot of mental anguish and mental beating yourself up. When your mom cries when you get a B, it's very serious. Does this B mean that I'm not going to get a good job, uh, my parents are going to still be poor, and my family is just going to be have such a hard life because I failed as a fifth grader and got a B in English. <laughs> so I think for so many Chinese kids, there's a lot of pressure because so much is riding on your education on, and on that grade. Were you ever tempted to slack off, to back away, to take it easy? No. <laughs> Somehow that just wasn't an option for me. My mom used to tell us, you know, you have to achieve, you have to. You have to be a doctor or a lawyer. You have to because you have to be the best. By the time she was raising her children, Michelle Ling's mother was comfortably middle class. But still, her message to her children was urgent. She used to tell us, you know, if they can choose between a white person and you, they're going to choose a white person. But if they know that the only way they're going to either stay out of jail or live is to use your services, then no matter how short, funny looking, slanty eyed you are, they're going to hire you. And that, I think, that in its way, I think is an extremely American idea. My mom pretty much ran our house, and she ran our house like a Navy ship. Michelle and her sisters were raised as model daughters. Well-mannered, respectful, devoted to school. For years, her parents' authority governed the home without challenge. On a day-to-day -day basis, if you did something wrong, you had to answer to mom. The more large, overarching, bad things you might do, like not become a doctor or a lawyer or whatever, you know, then there was always the threat of your father. Michelle's father was born in China, met his bride here while a medical resident, then moved to L.A. to practice. That's where Michelle grew up absorbing what was expected of her and what was not. I've had this experience with many of my Chinese friends where there's no discussion about shame or you never get a lecture about, you know, a family tradition and shame. You just already know that it's just there. There's like this undercurrent, this fog that permeates the whole house. That's just guilt. You know, family and guilt and, and disappointment, not just of yourself and your own potential, but just of this entire race. You know, my dad never really said that much because he didn't have to. You'd just be like, okay, never mind, I'll just go to medical school, you know, because that's, you know, it's fine. Whatever, whatever I was thinking, I don't know what I was thinking, never mind. So we moved here in the 80s, and um, the changes that we see now are that there are a lot more Chinese uh, folks living here. Just like my parents, they moved here so they can give their kids a better education because the school district in Arcadia is outstanding. Arcadia, Southern California. Jean Tang and her parents moved here when this was a modest suburb, mostly white. So was neighboring Monterey Park now headquarters for the Chinese communities that began to thrive in the 1980s. This is where you can eat a nice meal, you can do your grocery shopping, go to the bank, go to the post office, um, all speaking Chinese and not needing English at all. You 
If you go to Charles Schwab, even the tellers are Chinese. If you think about the medieval ages and you think about the Lord's castle and the fiefdom that the central point of the entire structure would be Ranch 99 or the Chinese supermarket. These communities are so tight that my parents have been here for 18 years and their English has not improved over time. On weekends, when all these families would get together, there would be the um, Yu's who owned the Chinese fast food restaurant. There would be other Tang's who owned different businesses. Uh, when we all get together for Mahjong, um, the competition wasn't really about um, how well your store business did. And it, it wasn't about growth and it wasn't about employees. It was all about how your children did. Oh, so-and-so's uh, got an award in school. They are most improved. Or so-and-so got to be um, on the evening news because of the spelling bee or something like that. And so in our living room, my mom and dad would always put out our awards and the medals we won um, in full display. <laughs> And, you know, it was very competitive within even our cousins. And so it, it, it was just a big part of my life. Um, I remember we would go to uh, my uncle's house and, and you know, you go swimming, I'd go play ping pong for a while, and then you would sit there and do algebra for two hours. And, and it sounds terrible, but, uh, but you know, you end, up, you end up learning things that you would never... But, you know, it was almost a game. It was fun rather than it's a chore. And then there's the typical thing that Chinese people do when they first get here. Um, and you, know, you randomly flip you know, to a page in the dictionary, and you got to remember five words from the dictionary, and you get tested the next day. It's not a change from Taiwan. I mean, Taiwan was even worse. So you know, this is actually, you get, to, you get to play and study. Rather than Taiwan, you just get to study. Math clinic, woohoo! That's what I need. Nobel Education Institute, <laughs> Harvard um, Education Institute. I think I occupy a very special spot in my family and community because I've done well. That would precede me in every place. So if we went to the barber shop or if we went to the supermarket, people knew about that and thought my parents did something right. And it wasn't until, I think, when I went to college when one of my interviewers for a scholarship asked me, am I happy? Is this what I want to be doing? And I thought to myself, what a strange question. Strange? <laughs> strange in the sense that this was... Uh, this was my job. This, these are the classes I needed to take. These were the grades I needed to get. But in terms of happiness, or is this really what you want? You know, that was almost secondary. My parents spent their entire lives working to fulfill that model minority, you know, vision. That's what they wanted. That's totally what they worked for their entire lives. Model minority. The term came into vogue in the 70s and 80s, applied to Asian Americans. It evoked strong families, self-reliance, and more than anything, being good at school. It was a stereotype, of course, which many Asians did not, do not fit. Yet, it was rooted in something real. My family was the kind of family where it was like, you know, are, not are you going to college, going to college, but which college? 